Hello everyone, I'm Chloe Johnson and welcome to this Fresh Business Thinking COVID-19 webinar series supported by BT. BT Skills for Tomorrow aims to empower businesses and their employees with the digital skills to help grow their business. The Skills for Tomorrow website includes free learning content that small businesses and their employees can access at any time. Topics such as connecting with customers on mobile, making sure your customers can find you online and much more. To find out more, click on the link in the comments. Coronavirus is continuing to be a challenge for small businesses and entrepreneurs across the UK. The outbreak leaves an overwhelming city of entrepreneurs, but this is a time and as a business community, we need to come together and support one another. And we're lucky enough to work with some organisations to do that. One of those is Hayes McIntyre an award-winning mid-tier firm of chartered accountants and tax advisors. With 35 partners and over 300 staff, Hayes McIntyre deliver a range of high quality accountancy, tax, corporate finance, and business advice to scale up businesses, often fast growing, owner managed and entrepreneurial businesses and listed companies across the UK and internationally. Today, Mark, Catherine and Natasha will be providing you with an overview of the government initiatives available during COVID-19. They'll also be covering R&D tax credit submissions, EMI schemes, and companies' house filing extensions, and the impact COVID-19 has on financial reporting, covering what directors need to be thinking about in, times, in terms of disclosure in their accounts in relation to how they are dealing with this crisis. This webinar will be broken up into five sections, focusing on what business should be doing, furloughing, tax deferral schemes, funding options, and financial reporting. Throughout the sessions, there'll be a handful of polls for you to vote on. Your vote will remain anonymous. At the end of each segment, we'll open up to a Q&A session. And if you'd like to leave any questions, then you can do this at the function in the bottom of your screen. That's all from me, and I'll pass over to Mark, Catherine, and Natasha. Thank you very much, Chloe. Um, hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Natasha Frangos and I head up the creative media and technology team um, at Hayes McIntyre. Um, thank you for that kind introduction, Chloe. For those of you who don't know us, um, we are a firm of accountants and tax advisors and we specialize in working with scaling entrepreneurial businesses across their life cycle. Um, we tend to get in at a relatively early stage and we'll be with them for the journey, uh, servicing them across a range of services along the way, whether that is beyond year end compliance, r and CMI, as they go through acquisitions with due diligence and then on to that event, whether that's a trade sale or an IPO. I'm joined today by two of my fellow partners, so Catherine Arthur, head of our private client team, and Mark Forward, one of our corporate tax and international partners. The last few weeks have actually felt like months for most of us, with matters evolving sometimes on a daily basis. Um, at times, we know some felt overwhelmed at the pace of change and new initiatives announced. Our team have been analysing the announcements and updating our COVID-19 information pages, and I'm really pleased that lots of clients and contacts have been finding our updates really useful. And they can continue to be accessed through our website and our social media channels, LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, our website is www.hazemcintyre.com forward slash COVID-19. Um, we'll continue to update those on a daily basis, offering practical advice on how to access schemes as they evolve. We've also, of course, been speaking to and assisting many clients throughout. We've had lots of different experiences and we can share what we've been, what we've seen working well and some of the challenges. And it will also be great to hear from you um, over the course of our session as well. I think during times like this, there's a lot to be learned from one another and also from sharing. We've put together a proposed agenda, which Chloe briefly ran over. It isn't set in stone and will be guided by you and your questions, um, but we will start with some thoughts on what should businesses be doing as a minimum during these times. Um, we'll give an overview on furlough. So we know that the claim link went live on Monday. They, re they reported 67,000 claims in the first 30 minutes. And we know that earlier this week, it was reported that nearly 400,000 companies have sought to make a claim. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear from your experience as well, um, if you have made um, a claim this week. 
We'll also talk about some of the cash flow easing mechanisms, the grant, loan, tax deferral schemes that are available. Um, we've, we've also heard um, from many businesses that are looking for funding, whether that's through the C-bills, um, alternative sources of funding, or the more recently announced Future Fund, as well as considering other initiatives for cash flow easing options to get through these odd months. Um, we know that there's certainty that we, we will get to an end, um, but the big uncertainty is that we don't know when that will be. So the priority for many businesses is on sustaining the business throughout this period. We also know that many companies have taken advantage of the company house filing extension that's been made available, but there are some who are still finalizing accounts and for one reason or another may not have been eligible for the extension. So we'll briefly cover well, what does COVID-19 pandemic mean for disclosures and reporting requirements in financial statements. It clearly increases the risk of going concern assessments um, and other areas such as stock provisions and, and debtor recovery. I'm conscious that we only have an hour, so we'll jump straight into the topics and we encourage people to submit their questions at the end of every session, as, as Chloe said, and we'll endeavour to help. Um, we, we as, as Chloe mentioned, we, we have got some polling questions, so please do get involved. Um, and then we perhaps will invite you to also share um, some, of, some of your, some further detail as we analyse those results as we go through. So our first topic is, well, what should businesses be doing as a minimum um, during these challenging times? So we've obviously been speaking to lots. And the first of all, I would say that you can't really afford to not do anything. I don't think I've spoken to a business yet that is not doing anything. Um, we know that there are yet more tough times ahead. We heard yesterday that the Bank of England governor thinks it's not implausible that we may be faced with a 35% contraction in GDP in the quarter end of 30th of June. I hope it isn't as severe as that, but it's clear that there will sadly be further pain and the full repercussions of that are still unclear and unfolding. As we know, the certainty is that we will get to an end of this period, but when will that be? So we need to, so businesses need to be able to survive the duration and the one benefit that scale ups and early stage businesses have over large corporations or one of the benefits is that they can be nimble. And that is a huge asset during these uncertain times, which causes businesses to view themselves in a different light. And if still operating, reassess how they go to market. So I've heard many stories of hope from online businesses or businesses that were a mix of physical store and online and how they have switched their focus to more online engagement with customers and they are seeing a benefit through an increase in sales from those avenues. So driving engagement on social platforms has helped a number of our clients retain relationships with customers, employees and suppliers alike. As well as looking for cash in, um, it's also imperative to, to look at where cash is flowing out of the business and slow that down where necessary. So now isn't really the time to run for the hills, as tempting as that is. Um, so it's important to keep visible in the business. So speak to, to creditors, speak to landlords, exhaust the government schemes that have been made available. Think about whether it's possible to negotiate loan repayment deferrals. So taking the necessary actions to survive. I was speaking to a client earlier today um, and they have a double digit retail, um, retail units. Um, so obviously have been badly hit um, with, the, with the lockdown, um, but they have had conversations with all of their landlords and they've been able to negotiate a mix of rent free holidays, rent deferral from all rent deferral from all but one landlord. So you just never know where those discussions will lead up. We also know of a business that approached a supplier and that supplier ended up investing part debt, part equity. Um, so negotiation does yield results and it brings people with you for the journey. I think the other the other um, thing that I've I've kind of heard a lot of is where entrepreneurs have been trying to get in touch with either investors or mentors, people that they that they think could add and bring value to their business and have been unsuccessful in doing so in the past. But now they've reached out to them and those people seem to have a bit more time on their hands, as you can expect, they're, they're at home more um, and they're willing to have conversations. So that might be another thing to think about is, well, who have I been trying to get in front of, whether that is a potential investor or a non-exec? And is it worth me now trying to, to attempt to speak to them? And see how they might be able to offer some advice during these, these times. 
Um, the British Chamber of Commerce releases their weekly Corona Business Impact Tracker, and this week they announced that cash flow remains a significant concern for many businesses, with six in ten having less than three months cash in reserve. To be able to assess the measures required to keep the business going, it's key to have an up-to-date cash flow. Um, I've spoken to clients who are literally re-forecasting at one point on daily basis and now maybe weekly and you have to keep revisiting it because things are evolving at such a pace and as you take on new initiatives whether that's seeing the impact of furlough and that cash grant in or whether it's being accepted for the c-bills loan and it's seeing well what impact does that have on my cash flow and how far can i make my cash stretch so it, the cash flow will absolutely be um, a document that's visited sometimes on a daily basis, but cash being the main focus right now, followed by PNL. Um, I was just going to ask actually whether my panelists had anything further to add on sort of measures that they've seen working well, and if not, then I was going to ask whether there were any questions at this stage before we move on to the next topic of um, furloughing. Uh, I think I, it's Catherine here. I just just like to add exactly that. I think encourage everyone to talk to their creditors. Um, some of the really interesting conversations in the last few weeks as to um, exactly what creditors are prepared to you know to accept and and to and to get you know get even more involved with the business. So I'd encourage everybody to do that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've just had. Um, one question come up so saying that they've been rejected for a 10k council grant um because they don't pay grant rates directly we pay all inclusive rents for our office is this correct and is there anything we can do um i mean i think it's definitely worth um appealing um we know that that a lot of people have received their grant rebates i think that statistic was released earlier this week wasn't it mark yeah afternoon everyone it, yeah Tash, it was and, and last statistic we talked about was 50 percent of business grants had business rate grants have been paid out i think there's been even a later update where roughly now 75 to 80 percent have been paid yeah i think i think with that question unfortunately it's one of the local authority because they're the ones that are in charge of the business rates yeah so it's a discussion with them it is a discussion obviously it could take a little while because they're obviously incredibly busy at the moment, but definitely worth appealing and having a conversation. Um, just see if we've got any more before we move on. No, okay. So, um, our, we've had the results in for the polling, which is great. So, part so it's quite a lot of people having good success there on renegotiating with their creditors or debt providers and some partly i don't know if anyone's got a good experience that they'd like to share with the audience on a renegotiation I have, yeah yeah so it's interesting on the cash runway which is in line with the statistics that have been released earlier um, this this uh, week. But I think we, there are a number of businesses that are coming to, to crunch points in the next sort of couple of months. Um, so all important um, timing for furlough coming out, especially with payday upon us. And on that, I think um, I, I, I did, I'd like it, I'd ask, Catherine, if she'd be happy to just share some tips on furloughing um, and, and what we've seen so far in our experience of that very valuable grant. Yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you. Um, as you say, Tash, cash is cash is king. Sorry, I seem to be having some problems with my camera, which might be a might be a benefit, actually, but I'll carry on anyway. Um, yeah, so the, the furlough scheme, um, the uh, the job retention scheme, one of the very first announcements from the government at the start of the, the pandemic, certainly at, at the start of the lockdown. And uh, lots of employers uh, were very relieved to hear about it, jumped onto it thinking, great, let, let's get going. 
Um, as Tesh already said, opening the, the portal on Monday of this week and the hundreds of thousands of applications that have been made so far is, is no less than, uh, no sort of stunning really. Normally it takes HMRC years to, to uh, put any new sort of system out. Um, so I think we, we need to be thankful for that. It seems to be holding up very well so far. So carry on making, making those claims. Um, key point obviously is to keep people in, in jobs. Um, let's see, it's been extended already to the 30th of June. Let's see if it's extended further. That's a distinct possibility. Um, uh, to, to extend it further than that, let's, but let's wait, let's wait and see. Sounds very, very straightforward. The headlines you'll all know, I'm sure, a grant of 80% of salary calls for employees who furloughed up to two and a half thousand pounds a month. Um, as an employee, you can choose to top that up if your salaries, uh, if your employee salaries are greater than that. The government will also pay the um, the employee, the employer's national insurance, sorry, and the employer's pension contributions up to the auto enrolment limits. So it's great and all sounds very straightforward on that basis. Of course, payrolls are complex by their very natures uh, with lots of different components within them. So whether it's commission, uh, bonuses, um, fees within that. And what I'd say is a general principle um, where those elements are part of regular pay, they can be included in the calculation and where they're not, they, sh they, sh they shouldn't be. Um, zero hours uh, uh, employees as well included. Um, some people are paid obviously weekly, four weekly, two weekly, every other combination you can imagine, everybody can be included. The calculations just need to be done. So um, this applies to all UK employers um, where employees were on the payroll the 19th of March. Originally, the employees had to be on the payroll at the 20, 28th of February, but there's, we've got a bit more of a leeway there. Um, and is now so very broadly uh, drafted now, which is, which is great. You can furlough um, an employee, must be for a minimum of three consecutive weeks. It does mean that actually if you've got a small team of people that you can rotate those on furlough. So if you haven't looked at that, you might want to consider that going forward. Um, it is absolutely vitally important, though, that the employees don't carry out any work while they're on furlough. Um, and that is absolutely, absolutely vital. Um, we've had a lot of questions in terms of, well, if I'm an, an owner manager, I'm a, a director, a statutory director of my own company. Um, can I uh, furlough myself, for example? So the answer is yes, uh, directors can, can be furloughed. Again, it's very important that they, that they don't do any work while they're on furlough. Um, the, the, the revenue and the government have confirmed that, they're, that a director can carry out his or her statutory duties. So it's important, and we'll come back to this point in a few minutes, it's important that all the company's house returns are filed, all the tax returns are filed, VAT returns, corporate tax returns, all of those are filed and filed on time. So it is important as a director, you can do, can continue to do those things, which is, which is, which is great. Um, so many of you will already have had a look at the process and had a look at the portal. For those who haven't, just very briefly in terms of that um, process, First thing's important is you tell the employees that you're going to furlough them. Uh, it is a, all of their employment rights carry on bar the furlough um, mechanism that we're putting in place. But obviously it is a big change for them and has to be put to them in, in, in writing. Um, we've talked about the portal, HMRC's portal going live. You do need a government gateway access account to, to access this, either in your own right as employer or alternatively, um, your payroll agent can do that. Now they need full payroll agent um, access to do that. Um, if anybody's got any queries, perhaps you can you can let me let me know, and we'll we'll go through the the detail of that. Um, HMRC have promised to pay um, within six working days. Hence the rush to get everything done by um, Wednesday, so two days into the portal process this this week. It's too early to say. We haven't actually seen anybody get their money yet, but hopefully the, by the beginning of next week that will begin to, to come through. Um, important to recognise as well that uh, the scheme is open till the end of uh, June now and a claim will be need, need to be made for every month's payroll. Vital too that the payroll is run in the usual way so that the RT, RTI um, payroll runs are done and obviously you're using furloughed amounts in those, in, in those payrolls instead. The other thing in terms of process is very dull, um, but is very, very important, is retain the records. Retain the records that you've um, sent to the employees, retain the calculations. 
Um, we believe that HMRC will do some audits after the event. I'm not quite sure when that will be as yet, but we do believe that will happen. They are very concerned about fraud and people setting up payrolls for um, fictitious employees and all those sorts of things. So there's a lot of checks and balances in place for that. Um, but do keep your sort of proof that the reason that you're um, furloughing staff is because of the, the current COVID-19 uh, crisis as well, uh, just in case somebody asks a question down, down the track. Um, there are some questions coming through, which perhaps if I can try and oh, multitask and read those at the same, <laughs> in the same time. Um, let me, do, let me just see. Yes, there's a really vital question from Elizabeth there in terms of directors. Um, as I said, a director has to be on the on the payroll to um, uh, furlough themselves. So that rule applies to directors as well as uh, employees generally. Um, if no payroll was run before the 19th of March uh, this year, with the director on that, then unfortunately, the way the rules are drafted and working so far, you will miss out on that. We have asked, uh, and many others have asked the same question. This is a bit arbitrary. So many doing annual payrolls for directors um, may not have done that by the 19th of, of March. So they may have done that later in March. So we're, we can update you once we know, once we hear back from HMRC on that. I hope that they'll move. But as I say, they are paranoid about um, fraud. Not I'm suggesting what you're you're doing is fraudulent. It's just they are paranoid about people taking taking advantage of the of the rules. It's it's clear as well that we're traditionally as a, a an owner and um, manager as a shareholder director of a business, you've taken a salary, small salary, and dividends. That those dividends do not qualify for this relief, unfortunately. Um, again, there's been a lot of pushback um to the revenue on that so let's let's wait and see whether that moves as well but so far the chancellor says well some you know some people have got to lose out and unfortunately that that's the group so so far so far absolutely um we've got the results in from the polls catherine as well which yeah. suggests 85 percent have said that they have furloughed just goes to show what a valuable scheme this is wow well, do you yeah. think it will be extended beyond June or what's your feeling? Well, I was I was thinking exactly that l last night, sort of listening to the, the news um, um, and thinking, well, this 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 thought that actually certainly the uh, social distancing is going to have to continue until Christmas. Um, what impact that has on us all generally, but on certain sectors more than others, obviously. Um, you've got to believe that this will be extended beyond the end of June. Um, wait, wait and see, but you've got to believe that. Mm -hmm. I hope so anyway. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I want just touching on one of the points that you mentioned in terms of the, that restriction where you cannot, your employee cannot do any work for the business when they're in that furlough status. And I know that we've spoken to clients, haven't we, where they're kind of doing that rotation of some team members on and off for the three weeks. Yeah. I wonder whether you could just say a little bit about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that so the minimum of three weeks, as I said, you're spot on, Tash. And it means then that given we've got through to the end of June now, that actually you may want to furlough a team member for three weeks, bring him or her back in to have a bit of a catch up on work, um, whatever is happening. And then, you know, and then put them back onto furlough at a later at a later stage. Um, it also, I think, gets people back into the work environment um, to have, you know, have them completely shut off until the end of June is quite a long time. So it is possible for them to do some work, but you have to take them off furlough and pay them in full for the time they're, they're not on furlough. Yeah. It is possible too. Maybe just to add, to add, I don't think I did. That it's possible for them to do training while they're on furlough. So people got studying to do or whatever. It's a good opportunity, um, and they can also volunteer. We had we had one or two of our staff volunteer um, because they wanted to for furlough because they wanted to volunteer for the NHS. So um, you know, it's a, a, a great opportunity for some people to do that too. Yeah. Catherine, there's a question. Uh, from Pat asking, can a company secretarial person be furloughed? Um, I think it's suggesting they're working from home, but his business is only two employees being a director and the company secretarial person. Uh, yeah. I think Pat, as, as Catherine's just mentioned, that no one on furlough can work from home. 
but the fact that the individual is a company sec chair or, or a director doesn't matter uh, that status doesn't matter does it Catherine in terms of being furloughed yeah absolutely but a but a company secretary um it can in principle be furloughed but can, but in the same way can't do any work at all i suppose if that company secretary is only doing the stuff that they do, then they can they can continue in the same way as they would for any other director but it's very one one um i listened to something the other day and somebody said you know effectively particularly if you're working from home and it's um you know a, a very much a family business by the sounds of things if i'm reading your question correctly then very much a basis of um your you know your your answer machine your emails or whatever is that you know we're not working and that any anything that you're doing is is purely in terms of those statutory duties in terms of whether that's you know filings of t the tax returns of the company secretarial returns at company's house that sort of thing thank you catherine just conscious that we're gonna um we've got lots of other topics to get through so um i, I wondered leading on from that whether we just sort of talk a little bit about some of those tax deferral schemes that are available um yeah. you know time to pay that deferral and self-assessment postponement i wonder whether we just touch on that for now as well yeah, yeah if i if i run through those quickly so there's a number again just the headlines of that so there's a there's a, a combination of some statutory deferrals and then um, uh, some time to pay arrangements, which is very much going to HMRC on, on, on a more formal basis and then saying, actually, can I um, agree a time to pay plan? So starting with the statutory deferrals, um, there are two main ones. So the first one is VAT. Um, and this is an automatic deferral, which means that no pay payments need to be made of VAT between 20th of March and the 30th of June this year. So those payments will then need to be paid in full by the 31st of March 2021, so next year, obviously. Um, it is important you submit the VAT returns on time, as I said, and if you have a direct debit in place to pay your VAT, do cancel it because it may go out of your bank automatically otherwise. Similarly, for all self-assessment taxpayers, so income taxpayers, um, who are due to pay a payment on account on the 31st of July this year, Again, that will be automatically deferred until the 31st of January this time, 2021. So when you'll pay your next um, self-assessment assessment payment at the end of January, no interest will be charged on um, that payment on account uh, in that time either, which is great. Most importantly, there's no equivalent of this for PayUIE. So there's no automatic deferral of PayUIE. I suppose that is the other side of the coin of the, um, the job retention scheme we've just been talking about. Um, so moving on then quickly to the time to pay arrangement. So um, right back at budget time, um, uh, back in the, the, the middle of March, um, the HMRC uh, announced a dedicated COVID-19 helpline to agree install, uh, the uh, instalment plans be put in place. So this covers all taxes, so including those where there are those automatic deferrals, um, but also I haven't talked about corporate tax yet, but obviously that's included too. Um, this is very much an evolving process. So the helpline was announced first, these deferrals were announced later, so the team answering all these calls on this helpline have got quite a challenge ahead of them. Um, what we're seeing though is a real combination of things so that um, our clients are having great success in agreeing uh, def uh, additional deferrals. So say it's a corporate tax bill um, and saying, okay, we'll have a two month deferral of paying that or agreeing installment plans up to 12 months. Um, what I say is have your information ready before you pick up the phone and the helpline numbers on our website and we can certainly uh, circulate that as well. Have all the information ready or your, your tax references, your bank account details and so forth. I'd also say have a cup of coffee ready because it's going to take you a while <laughs> to get through. Um, up to an hour, I'm told. I haven't actually done one myself this week, but um, I'm told it's taking some time. HMRC are asking for limited information at this stage, but we think that will increase as we get into sort of some form of new normal. And again, I make the point that it's absolutely vital that the tax returns on which you're claiming that time to pay have been submitted um, before you actually make the call. So probably at least 24 hours before you make that call. Otherwise, HMRC won't have the information to, to do that. 
I think that's all I want to say, Tash. Thank you very much for that, Catherine. Um, and then Mark, I just wondered whether you wanted to say anything from a corporation tax perspective. For example, there might be some businesses that are on quarterly instalments. There might be some businesses that are forecasting to make a loss this year as they'd made a profit in the previous year. And whether we had any advice to give around that. Yeah, thank you, Tass. Yes, it, what you're talking about there is planning in a way outside of the government support schemes. So first, say, looking at uh, losses and ability to carry back. And I also add on to that R&D tax claims. So um, first of all, with losses, you can carry them back for 12 months. Of course, with I imagine many of the listeners here, they're submitting R&D tax claims to obviously get the cash credit back from um, the government. What we're seeing and advising a lot of clients to do is actually thinking about shortening their accounting period end in order to um, accelerate the preparation of their accounts, tax comp and R&D claim, submit that to the revenue and get the cash credit back as soon as possible. Current timelines are roughly four to six weeks, um, more to the four weeks rather than the six. So I think that's definitely worth considering because it's probably better to claim 10 months of your R&D now rather than wait for another two months to claim a full 12 months. So that's definitely worth thinking about. And, and okay, and then for those companies that um, pay their corporation tax under the course the instalment regime, um, where you do, you know you will do, some of them would have already paid some payments on account to the revenue uh, in anticipation of profits or profit forecasts pre-COVID. Now, when you revisit those forecasts of profit for the year, it will look probably look like actually um, we're going to pay a lot less tax and probably resulting that our previous course installments means we overpaid. Now, under that regime, you're very much entitled uh, to um, you're very much entitled to um, right to the revenue to reclaim that uh, repayment. Thank you, Mark. Um, and we've just had a question come in. Um, which, which you, you, you have covered, um, Catherine, but maybe we'll just, just for the benefit of this question, um, asking, can the tax referral apply to POIE? Kathy's probably on mute. Sorry, I can answer. No, this. Yeah. We can see your lips moving, but couldn't hear you. One of us is going to do that. One of us. Sorry, sorry. So sort the they sort the camera issue out, and then and then don't come take myself <laughs> off mute. My apologies. Um, yeah. So the, the, there's no statutory deferral for pay ye, as I said, but you can ask HMRC for time to pay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, right. So I'm just looking at those poll results, actually. So. Yeah, lots of people making the most of the government packages that are available. 65% feel that they know what's available, which is great. 55% are making use of them, uh, feel that they're making full use of them. Uh, split decision, which is what we probably expect actually in terms of has the government gone far enough? Um, but there's some success stories there on time to pay for HMRC, Catherine, not, not a huge percentage. I, was, I, would, I would have thought it'd be higher, actually. Yeah, and that and that would be that would be interesting to you know uh, hear more from people as to what the sort of barriers are there. Mm. Um, it I think HMRC have got an interesting challenge, you know, to keep that some form of balance um in in this um but certainly um you know people want to get in touch afterwards then we can we can chat through some of the, the specifics if they want to yeah absolutely great thank you Catherine, um, i think a question's just come in it's quite an interesting one uh, a bit unique in the current environment but um we know the vat is an automatic deferral if a company wanted to keep on top of their payments and make their VAT payment are they can they still do so yeah, really good question, actually. Yes, absolutely. So where there are automatic deferrals, either for VAT or indeed or for um, self-assessment, then absolutely. If you just want to keep that, keep your cash flow going, keep the planning going, um, make those payments on time if you want to, or make you know payments towards those payments if you want to do that. I mean, certainly on the self-assessment side, we've got lots of clients coming back and saying, well, actually, I should be OK for July. What I don't want to do. Um, is build up a problem and have yet more to pay in, in, at the end of January. So I will pay my July, July payment or at least as much of it as I can afford at that point. So that makes sense, yeah. 
Great, thank you. And some good questions as well coming through. So thanks for that. Um, I just thought we would move now on to another area that we've had lots of discussions as you'd expect, which are what are the funding options that are available? Um, so we know that CBILS has had a lot of, um, attracted a lot of conversation um, in the media as well. Um, and it was reported earlier this week that the bank and finance sector have provided over 2.8 billion to SMEs so far. Um, I think the amount of um, successful applications doubled this week from the week before. Um, we're now up to about 16,000 loans that have been provided and the numbers are increasing. However, that 16,000 number is tiny compared to the actual number of companies that have expressed an interest which I think has been reported to be in excess of 300,000. Um, we know that the UK has was one of the leading fintech communities, so I'm really pleased that um, some of the alternative lenders have been brought on, like Funding Circle, Iowa Walker and Starling Bank. So I do think the number of um, applications being processed will be aided by broadening um, the uh, number of providers of C-bills. Um, another interesting statistic that came out was that the average loan value is reported to be about 180,000. Um, I, I question whether that's indicative then that these loans are maybe not reaching the startup small business community um, because they're, they're, it's a rather large average. Um, and that could be probably problematic for this significant part of the UK market. I read just this morning that I think the Treasury is considering offering 100% um, guarantee instead of 80% um, for loans of up to 25,000. Um, they said that there may be there may be an announcement. Uh, we can expect an announcement early next week. I think this move brings us more in line with what what's been happening with some of the European countries, like in Germany and Switzerland. Um, in terms of what we've seen in our clients, so we've had a handful of clients who have successfully applied, um, but we have spoken to many more who have applied but not yet got to the end of the process or not been successful. Um, I think uh, that the speed of a decision um, can be detrimental uh, to a business. I, I kind of worry about that. We know that in other European countries, money is being paid into the banks within a couple of days of application. Um, I think the delay comes with there being quite a complicated application process. So I think it could be benefited from simplification and perhaps standardization across the banks. Um, I, I was speaking to a client earlier who has said that they've probably been in discussions with their bank coming up to a month now. Um, and then two weeks after submitting some information, the bank has come back and asked for some more uh, just today. So I, I think that kind of, there is, not managing the expectations of the businesses is also holding up um, the application process. Um, it would be interesting to hear if anyone has had what, what the experience of the audience is. I don't know if um, anyone can share some of their stories. I think we've got our, our, um, our, our um, polls gone up, hasn't it? Um, but we the other thing that we, we've had a lot of conversation with clients on is personal guarantee position so um, we know that a couple of weeks ago it was announced that for loans under 250,000 the provider cannot request personal guarantees and for loans over 250,000 the personal guarantees will be limited to just 20% of the amount outstanding on Siebel's lending. Um, but um, I, I have still heard that some clients have been asked for personal guarantees because maybe it's not, it's a mixture of different funding options, not just the bills. Um, so it, it will be interesting to see how that evolves and how the changes that were implemented a couple of, a couple of weeks ago will help speed the process of um, applications being accepted. Um, I wondered whether, Mark, you could also share a bit of information on the future fund that was announced earlier this week i know that we've received quite a lot of interest haven't we yeah absolutely um yeah so very much the future fund is new kid on the block it was announced on monday um, there has been no further government announcements since then uh, the contents of the announcement was a the bright light announcement some initial guidance and then the expected headline terms of the type of investments. So to give a broad overview 
of what it is and then my thoughts afterwards. So the government is making available, uh, how they refer to it is, is bridge financing of up to um, 125,000 to 5 million uh, per applicant, applicant. And the idea behind that is then the amount raised from the government is matched by third party private investors. The instrument of the bridge financing, as they call it, is a convertible loan, which carries an interest rate of 8% per annum, non-cumulative, um, maturity rate of up to 36 months, and also it is a convertible kicker. Um, when it is converted with either, uh, well, you have the option to repay it, or it can convert on automatic events, for example, like a, a sale of the business, um, et cetera. Now, to be eligible, uh, it is at the moment very light criteria on eligibility. Further guidance will be announced. I, I do reckon it'll be a roller coaster until it finally is uh, released, this scheme. But the current eligibility is it's a UK uh, registered company, is unlisted, and in the last five years has raised equity finance of no less than £250,000 from third party private investors. In terms of timing, it is scheduled to open in May, no other date than just May, and it'll be open until uh, the end of um, September. So the whole idea is the government will give you money as long as it's matched uh, by third party private investors. So my thoughts on that is while it's in headlights, it is saying the government is providing support and being matched by uh, investors, Actually, what needs to happen is actually private investors need to come to the table first, and then the government is then willing to support uh, and and, dupe, and double the amount of money being invested up to up to five million, um, and, and go from there. So, so very much you need to get your private investors in first. Okay, so it's a little bit misleading from the government. They're providing the support. They're only matching what other people are committing to be done. The other thing is I've mentioned twice. So there's two conditions third party um, private investors, A, from the previous uh, 250 grand eligibility criteria of, sh of share monies being raised in the last five years, as well as third party investment for the matched funding. Um, what does third party mean? We just don't know. Does that mean if you had a majority shareholder who was willing to provide the funding in, they're not third party enough? Um, is it 50%, is it 25%, or does only shareholder not matter at all? So that completely needs clarity on that point. It is, could be considered to be expensive. If the loan is repaid, they are looking for a 100% premium on the original amount, so you're paying two times back. If it is converted, then what the government are looking for is a maximum discount rate of 20% of your last funding round share price, whatever that might be. Um, another thing is the matched investment by the private um, investors has to also be this type of loan finance, this convertible loan. So at the moment, I think the government are missing a real trick um, in that such loan finance does not qualify for EIS. And I expect oh, the Enterprise Investment Scheme, EIS, and I expect a lot of the companies looking for this funding will also be EIS qualifying companies. And therefore for private individuals, this type of financing is very unattractive. Why go down the loan route with no EIS, even when that loan is converted, it is clear EIS does not apply to that kind of instrument, when instead I would prefer to have um, equity, which I will get EIS and all the great reliefs that EIS afford. So I think the government needs to rethink that. Why do private investors need to have the same type of instrument? I think what the priority here is, is there is some contribution from the private world, or which the government is then willing to match. So therefore, the type of monies coming in by the private world shouldn't really be matter. matter. It is the contribution to me, which is key. Um, and that's it really in a nutshell, just to recap on timing, not open yet, a lot of guidance still to come, a lot of clarification is required. Um, hopefully open in May, hopefully it's earlier of May, and then we'll come in at the end, of, and is still alive until the end of September for now. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because a hugely valuable segment of the UK investment world are angels. Um, Absolutely. And so far we've not seen enough to entice them back to the table, have we? I mean, they're still there 
a lot of them still want to support um, startups and scale ups. Um, but obviously there needs to be something to bring them into the conversation and we haven't yet seen that. We know that yesterday it was announced that the British Business Investments, which is the subsidiary of the British Business Bank, has committed a 10 million 10 million pounds to Stephen Page, who we know as well, Startup Funding Club, which is which is excellent. Um, and we know that, that those monies will be invested alongside Startup Funding Club's SEIS and EIS funds, um, as well as the Startup Funding Club Angel Network. So I think they're hoping to fund something like more than 100 um, startups with that. But it will be, I, I, you know, I, I watch um, with interest to see whether that sort of soaks up more focus on this aspect of the market. Um, we know that the government are listening and hence the reason why I think all the new measures are coming out and they're evolving. So, I, so I, I do encourage people to use their voice because I think the government are receptive to that and changes will be brought in. And my hope is, as Mark touched on, I hope that this is made more attractive so that things like the IS can be brought into the mix because then that just opens up a whole um, new part of the market with, you know, liquidity that can help bring into these businesses. Yeah, um, Ross has made a really good question and it's, I've seen it already and had discussions with clients on this. I think there'll be a lot of companies out there who are in the process of raising money. The future fund is coming and everyone now is, is pausing. Can my investments qualify? Of course, most of the investments being taken in is by way of equity. So Ross, uh, as it stands at the moment now, no, your current financing round does not qualify for, for the future funds, which is a real shame because obviously investors are getting twitchy. They probably might not proceed with the investment round. Future fund is of no help and therefore we, we haven't resolved the position whatsoever. So yeah, I can't stress enough how the government needs to revisit the type of um, investment made by the private world. Um, yeah, I, I suppose having said that, of course, overseas investors, institutional investors, or people not really qualify for, for EIS, um, yeah. obviously what you can do while you're waiting to May and actually how the guidance and the actual legislation turns out on this is, is actually to start talking to such investors to line them up. Uh, and then in comes the government financing to, to, to match what they're putting in. So at the moment, don't wait for the guidance, speak to, speak to such investors to, to tee them up. Thank you, Mark. Um, I just thought we'd have a quick look at the poll results. Um, so nearly 50% of our audience has applied or will apply for the Seabills loan but only 5% have so far successfully secured the funding, which I think kind of drives, really drives the message home, doesn't it, in terms of how long this process is taken um, and the number of successes um, that we're seeing. And, and we have, like, the numbers that have been reported, there is definitely a move to processing more applications, but it'll be interesting to see how that evolves, for sure. Um, Okay, thank you. And thank you for all the, the great questions so far. Um, I was just going to now just conscious of time. So we're last down to our last 10 minutes. Um, so we'll just quickly cover off um, financial reporting. So and filing extensions. So we know that Companies House um, have made available um, the option for companies to extend their filing deadline by three months. You have to proactively apply for this before your filing deadline. Um, it takes less than 15 minutes to apply. It's really easy. Um, and it uh, you give your reasons and then you're granted your extension. Um, but we know that there are also some companies that are fundraising accounts or for whatever reason haven't been able to take the extension. Um, and so therefore, what do the directors need to consider um, in finalising these accounts. So COVID-19 is classified as a post balance sheet event. So um, some disclosure will be required in the financial statements in terms of the, what the financial impact of the business is. Um, the directors should be making an, an estimate of what the expected impact is. But of course, there is just too much uncertainty to be able to put a number to it, I would expect in the majority of cases. Um, 
um, where this is the case, um, then um, it should be disclosed in the accounts that it cannot be reliably measured. Um, and then, of course, there will be um, increased risk on going concern assessments. So it's all important to have. So all those cash flow forecasts that are also being used for uh, bank applications, I imagine your auditors will also want to see them. So um, be prepared for uh, questioning on those and then considering what the implications are on audit reports. Um, but it also brings into question certain balances on the balance sheet. So, for example, is there an increased risk of stock obsolescence? Are, are any of your debtors considered recoverable? And therefore, what provisioning should be applied to those um, balances? And those are the kind of conversations that we're certainly having with some of our audits that are ongoing at the moment. Um, as we're coming to an end, I'll just check if there's any other there's, there's one it's, it's back to furloughing but i think it's quite an important question if you don't mind tash let's jump back to yeah, furloughing for catherine yeah. for catherine and that was about um staff having holiday time while on furlough what's the position there catherine a mute again <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. Um, I'm busy nodding and nodding at you, Mark. My apologies. Um, yeah, a couple of quick points on holiday and furloughing. So two things. Um, while an employee is on furlough, their own holiday entitlement continues to accrue, which is one thing. Um, an employee can have holiday while they're on furlough, um, but you can't force them to have holiday while they're on furlough. Um, and if they do take holiday while on furlough, then holiday pay applies in the usual way. So um, it will depend on what your contract says and so forth. But generally, that will mean then that you're paying the employee for their holidays and you're not paying the furlough rate at that point if they're taking holiday. Um, the same is true as if, um, if people are ill while they're on furlough, then they're entitled to statutory sick pay um, rather than the, the, full, the full amount of the, the furlough amounts, if I can call them that. Hope that helps. Thank you very much, Catherine. It does. Thank you. Um, okay, let's just see. I think we've got the results. So not many people have applied for a company's house extension, which is interesting, actually. But I guess there are still there's still time for that, isn't there, in a way? Um, but as we also touched on earlier, there may also be a benefit for shortening year ends and getting in an extra R&D claim. Um, just to help as another measure of cash flow easing. So, and that's kind of the opposite of extending um, out that there's an incentive to get your accounts in earlier, as well as if, for example, you're forecasting corporation tax loss and being able to carry that back again if you were profit making in the previous year. Um, okay, so I think we'll um, can wrap up. I just would love to say. Thank you to our audience. Thank you for listening. Um, and thank you to our my colleagues, Catherine and, and Mark, for your insights. We hope that you found um, the session helpful. Um, and thanks for also taking part in the polls, which is which was really insightful for us as we were going along. Um, undoubtedly, um, this pandemic has thrown many of us off course. Um, some have been forced to completely shut up shop for now. So we've got clients that are in that position if they're restaurants or hotels. Um, and there have been some casualties along the way already. And sadly, I think there are going to be some more. But for many clients, we also know that there's a sense of trying to adjust and get back to a form of business as normal um, as they try and think work towards what that new future might look like, whatever it might look like. It will leave, this will leave a marked impact on our economy. So I was listening to the founder of financial data platform Fugil um, a couple of days ago, and he said that from the information that they gather from Companies House, that kind of comes through their software. And they were saying that he's seen a 50% decrease in new company incorporations compared to um, April last year. And they had seen an 87% increase in the companies going into administration into early April. So already seeing the impact there in terms of, um, you know, new business startups. Uh, it will be a long road to recovery and we're not sure what that look, will look like. Um, we saw that yesterday it was reported that it will be 
more of a slower U-shaped recovery, but you know, I hope it's not an L-shaped deep recession uh, uh, scenario, uh, but it could even perhaps be more of a W-shaped as we kind of come back, but then there's another spike in viruses and then further lockdown measures and, and then the um, on, ongoing impact on the economy there. I think probably, you know, all, all um, options are feasible at this stage. But what we do know is that the government are actively responding to challenges. And, and as we said, again, we think that those measures and initiatives are evolving as they respond to voices um, in the market. Uh, and we'll continue to see that, I believe. I think one thing this, this pandemic has done is it's shone a light on the challenge problem areas in all businesses. Some of those problem areas, we probably have always been there and perhaps we've not had the impetus to act. Um, now it's time to take action and address those areas. We can't afford to not do anything. There's lots of initiatives to exhaust as a minimum. However, when we emerge, which may not be for many months, no doubt, um, I think it will be a future with a greater sense of community, respect for one another, mindfulness of people's health and well-being, greater flexibility as we have all embraced remote working. I think we've all been thrown into somewhat of an experiment um, as all of our businesses have had to adjust. Um, in some cases, it's resulted in many years of digitization in the matter of a couple of months. Um, there are lots of valuable learnings and themes which should continue as we move forward, including building businesses with people, purpose and resilience at their heart. Um, I think I just wanted to, I wanted to end on a bit of a positive note. Um, so I, all that's left is for me to say thank you. And please do feel free to contact any one of us directly or through our dedicated COVID email address should you have any further queries. Mark, Catherine and Natasha, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the webinar. I'm sure our audience will agree that session was incredibly beneficial for all those entrepreneurs and businesses out there battling through the current situation. If there is anything you'd like to catch up on from today's webinar, we'll be sending out a replay coming shortly to our social media channels. Our next webinar in the Business COVID-19 series, supported by BT, takes place on Tuesday the 28th of April at 2pm and we'll be joined by Catherine Green, who will be discussing how to prepare to negotiate your next deal. If you haven't already, you can register for this webinar at freshbusinessthinking.haysummit.com or you can click the link in the comments. Thank you very much for joining us today and thank you to Hayes, for, to Hayes McIntyre for joining us as well.